in this, this event. Okay, I'll, I'll wait for you to give you a second to move on up. It'll also be easier for facilitating questions. I've got the mic, so they can hear me better. Okay. <laughs> but when, we, when they're speaking, did you get your question? Okay. So to begin, while you're moving, there are three organizations that really deserve thanks for this presentation this evening. One would be the Institute for Conservative Studies, a student-based organization here on campus, led by David. And the other would be the James Madison Institute, who helped us promote the event and, and basically made this a success. And finally, my organization, the Collegians for a Constructive Tomorrow, partnered with Committee for a Constructive Tomorrow. We're called CFACT. And what we are is a nonpartisan, nonprofit, 501c3. And we were an educational foundation founded in 1985. And our issues are that we believe that free market approaches and limited government approaches work best when approaching energy and environmental issues. Now this evening's presentation is entitled, Turning Up the Heat on Global Warming. And Dr. Roy Spencer is a senior scientist for climate studies at NASA. And his book is Climate Confusion, How Global Warming Hysteria Leads to Bad Science, Pandry Politicians, and Misguided Policies That Hurt the Poor. And in part, his remarks will be based on that. He's also the principal research scientist at the University of Alabama in Huntsville, where he directs a variety of climate research projects. He has a PhD in meteorology from the University of Wisconsin, which is also my alma mater. Go Badgers. And he's also a senior scientist for climate studies at NASA. Used to be. He, yes, he's the former uh, U.S. science team leader for the Advanced Microwave Scanning Radiometer for KOS. Oh, that currently. <laughs> <laughs> and he's co-developer of the original satellite method for precise monitoring of global temperatures from Earth-orbiting satellites. He's also testified before Congress. He's a very prestigious gentleman. So please join me in giving him a very warm welcome. Mr. Dr. Lewis. First of all, um, I suppose I should mention, I don't know whether this is a disclaimer or what, or um, you know, full disclosure. Uh, there's rumors out there that I'm funded by Big Oil, which isn't true. I've never been asked by Big Oil to do anything, let alone get paid for doing it. <laughs> I wish, though. And <laughs> uh, Also, what I want to talk about tonight is, is mostly science, but it's hopefully it's going to be simple enough for you to understand that I'm still trying to get it simple enough so that regular folk. Is anybody here from the Department of Meteorology? Okay. Good, I can lie and you won't know. <laughs> um, I want to go over some new science that you should have known about by now if you follow global warming issues in the news, uh, because we've had two peer-reviewed published uh, papers uh, out there in the literature and the mainstream media has refused to report on it and it's because the mainstream news media is not interested in reporting on anything that doesn't support Al Gore's view of apocalyptic global warming. So I'm basically having to go around uh, and give talks because I think the public needs to be better educated on this issue because there, if, if, you, if you just rely on the, on the media um, for this stuff, you're going to get a very biased view. Not that I'm going to tell you what the majority believes, because that's not true. I think I am part of the minority, and as part of the minority, uh, Al Gore likes to call us global warming deniers. I don't know of anybody that denies global warming. That's part of the rhetoric of all of this. Uh, what we deny is that we have any handle at all on how much of that warming in the last hundred years, let's say, has been due to uh, mankind versus nature. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is our latest evidence that uh, most global warming in the last hundred years might well be natural. Uh, first of all, I'd like to talk about the culprit, CO2. If you don't already know, it's necessary for life on Earth. We have to have it uh, for photosynthesis. And without photosynthesis, we'd die, because uh, we wouldn't have any food. Um, and there's precious little CO2 in the atmosphere. Only 39 out of every 100,000 molecules of, of the atmosphere are carbon dioxide. Uh, so there's really not that much of it. And it takes us five full years to add one to that. 
takes humanity pumping, like Al Gore likes to say, 70 million tons of CO2 into the atmosphere every day like it's an open sewer. That's the way he puts it. Well, you know, it's necessary for life. There's precious little of it in the atmosphere. We are adding to it very slowly, okay? Um, also, you've probably heard that mankind's CO2 emissions are like only 5% of the natural flows of CO2, which is technically, technically correct, but it doesn't mean what it sounds like it means. Uh, Mother Nature emits a lot more carbon dioxide out of the surface in the atmosphere than we do. But Mother Nature also takes out about an equal amount from the atmosphere into the surface. So those two presumably have been in balance for a long time, centuries, who knows, or roughly in balance. And when we came along and started burning fossil fuels, we're adding more CO2 to the atmosphere. And the CO2 content is slowly rising. And I believe that we are most, if not all, of the reason for the rise. Uh, also, what's interesting is that ever since we started um, pumping CO2 into the atmosphere, um, you know, by large amounts, which really was only started maybe 30 or 40 years ago, no matter how much we dump into the atmosphere, Mother Nature sucks out half of the excess. It's like nature loves CO2, which might make sense because it's necessary for life. I just wanted to provide that backdrop to make it clear that CO2 isn't a pollutant unless, as the Supreme Court was convinced, uh, it causes serious global warming. Okay. CO2 is a greenhouse gas. I'm sure of that. We have satellite instruments in orbit that measure the temperature profile down through the atmosphere that would not work if it were not for the greenhouse effect. So there is such a thing as the greenhouse effect. CO2 is a greenhouse gas. It's a small part of the greenhouse effect. Here I'm showing that about 90 to 95 percent of the Earth's natural greenhouse effect is due to water vapor and clouds. And then carbon dioxide and methane are minor uh, components. The greenhouse effect you can think of as a radiative blanket surrounding the Earth. It, it traps infrared radiation in the lower atmosphere, keeps the lower atmosphere and the surface warmer than they would otherwise be without the greenhouse effect. Okay, it's, some people, you, you've probably heard it said that the greenhouse effect helps keep the Earth habitably warm. Examples of the greenhouse effect. A humid night doesn't cool off as much as a dry night. A cloudy night doesn't cool off as much as a clear night. Those are examples of the greenhouse effect in action, okay? Now, what most people don't realize, or this might come as a surprise to you, nobody on the science side of this issue is concerned, really, about the direct warming effects of CO2 because they're pretty small, maybe one degree C by the end of the century. We have to compute that theoretically with a model, uh, but it's a simple computation and other people have done it and we doubted it and we did it and everybody gets about the same answer. I'm willing to accept it. The point is, is the direct warming from just the CO2 is small, where all of the argument is, is how does the system respond? Will clouds change in such a way to amplify the warming or decrease the warming? It's what we call feedbacks and it's related to climate sensitivity. So, for instance, if there's positive feedbacks that are a result of more water vapor going into the atmosphere, as the atmosphere warms from the extra CO2, that's a positive feedback. Leads to more warming, okay? And there's a number of different ways to get feedbacks. Uh, clouds. Fewer low clouds would be a solar positive feedback. If it gets warmer and there's fewer low clouds, you know that low clouds reflect sunlight, right? Uh, if there's fewer low clouds, it lets more sunlight in, that amplifies the warming. That's a positive feedback. Negative feedback would be down here, that when there's warming from the CO2, the extra CO2 we're putting in the atmosphere, negative feedbacks would fight that, would diminish it, can't get rid of it, at least not theoretically through any simple mechanisms we know about, but reduce it. So, these indirect effects our feedbacks and all climate models, there's about 20 of them, used by the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The IPCC, they're the supposedly 2,500 scientists that all agree that global warming is a serious problem. 
uh, all of the climate models that are used by them from different countries, uh, they all have positive feedbacks. And that's what I'm here to dispute tonight. And I'm not the only one, okay? I may be in the minority in terms of the climate research community on this. Uh, but if you talk to meteorologists that don't work in climate, I think you'll find most meteorologists by training, you know, weather people, weather forecasters, I think most are skeptical of, of mankind being the cause of global warming. And the reason 